I want to talk a little bit more about the business of emotional intelligence, mm-hmm. um, because obviously, do, I mean, you're a musician, and music's very important to you, and music is, by definition, a very emotional thing for most of us. You know, we all have tracks that we, we associate with certain times in our lives, you know, that can bring back memories and all that sort of thing, can move us uh, when we hear them. Do you think that, you know, that, that's a, that it's a coincidence or not that you're a good musician and you're also very interested in emotional intelligence in the workplace? I don't know whether it's it's a coincidence or not. Uh, I tend to feel that my work in emotional intelligence at work is about people, and it's trying to develop relationships with people in the way that I would encourage them to carry on doing with their contacts. Um, I find in singing in a choir that's hugely communal by definition, whereas as a coach you feel like a bit of a loner on your own albeit that you are working with other people. As a composer and arranger, it's entirely isolating. You're just sitting in front of your computer or your, your keyboard, um, and anybody else in the room is, is possibly a distraction. So I tend to, f- I've always personally felt that they balance each other, that I wouldn't want to actually do just one of them, that they're actually complementary rather. But yes, it's all about. But any, it's all. Everything's about emotion in, in the end. I suppose it is. Yeah. Uh, anything that's about people. But I suppose the difference is uh, perhaps thinking about this a bit more. Um, that with music, you don't really have. Well, I think I don't really have very much control over my emotions with music. If I love a piece of music, it moves me. I don't make a conscious decision to be moved. It just happens. Um, with people, I mean. Okay, Okay, with the exception of falling in love at first sight and that sort of thing, if, if you believe that happens. But, but most of the time with people, we do make some decisions, don't we? We make decisions about whether we like somebody. We, we perhaps make more of an effort to get to know certain people. And obviously in the workplace, we have no choice. You know, we, are, we sit next to somebody in the, in the open plan office or, or, we, or we have to work closely with somebody, uh, either physically or even over, over the telephone and email and so on. So we, we, we are... We, when, you know, we, we have less choice there. Uh, we, have to, you know, we have to take steps then to make things work. Um, so I suppose it's a di- I suppose what I'm trying to say in a rather long-winded and, and uh, uh, not very clever way is that it's a different type of emotion, perhaps. It is. I think music triggers emotions that you have about yourself, about things that have happened to you in the past. Uh, whereas, as you say, in the workplace, it's all about interacting with other people. However, the way that we interact with other people is only based on how we've interacted with the people in the past and our experiences of interacting with people in the past. So, ultimately, our responses, whether it's to a piece of music, which, if you're listening to a CD or to a radio station, is entirely passive. There's one-way communication going on, uh, whereas at work it's two-way communication. So you would expect it to be more complicated... But at the end of the day, the, the source of our response, whether it's to a piece of music or to a person, is ourselves and our prior experiences. So that, that, that again, brings up a whole other uh, set of issues in, in, in the sense that if we are all uh, the sum of our experiences, and I suppose we kind of, I guess most of us would assume that, but, uh, but you've stated it there, um, then that's going to make sometimes perhaps that means it's going to be more difficult for us to cope with certain situations because of our past experiences and and obviously one could cite examples of that sort of thing I guess Uh, so you're starting at a disadvantage sometimes because of your past experiences yes but uh, you can't use that as an excuse or it's I don't think it's tenable to use it as an excuse because we're all blessed with uh, intelligence uh, and the ability to do things differently Uh, And often what I say to clients who are are doing things that are not in their best interest is you just have a choice. You can just choose to do something different. Do it right now. And then we had the conversation about how come they didn't make the choice at the moment I clicked my fingers. Because actually it's that resistance to change which is the issue. It's not the previous experience. It's why people won't move out of their comfort zone if you want to put it like that why they're fearful of going to a networking event in a business context why why they're fearful of approaching somebody in the street who they would like to talk to uh it's all about the fact that we do have choice and the one word we haven't used yet which is important which is subconscious or unconscious a lot of what's going on in our mind we are not aware of by definition it's unconscious 
doesn't mean to say it's not going on. And a lot of our responses to music and to situations with people is unconsciously driven in the first place, and you only become aware of it later. And I suppose that's your role as a coach, is to, is to perhaps make you more aware of, of those unconscious reactions mm. so that you can then perhaps modify them if, if that's appropriate. Indeed. I mean, I, I, as a coach, I have coaching myself. I was having a session only on Friday. Uh, it's a lot easier for the coach to see what's going on for the client often than it is for the client to see it. Um, and I'm completely aware that, that I have my own blind spots uh, and stuff that I need to address in the same way that everybody else does. Um, I just, perhaps because of my training and my practice in doing it, at least in some cases, perhaps most cases, feel that I can help clients by just pointing out why they might be doing something. I was coaching a guy um, the other day. He wanted, his issue was really around perfectionism. He was just very self-critical of himself. And so I sort of took a punt, really. Some people I wouldn't have said this to, certainly not on the first session. But to him, I thought he would be able to take what I was going to say next and that was that people use perfectionism as a way of not moving forward and so for some people it gives them the excuse to beat themselves up as well if they have running a, a negative view of themselves and he was quite receptive to that idea okay. um, so it's really then working with the person to find out if what I say is of any value to them any use to them and if it is developing that and, and if it's not moving on to something else so what the way that I work is perhaps slightly more directive than some coaches is that most coaches believe that the client has all the capacity to solve the problems that they need it's just a question of if you spend enough time coaching them they'll get it well I would prefer to do it rather quicker and certainly in a business context clients want to get the shift they don't want the coaching they want the results of the coaching so I often shortcut things uh, and most of the time it seems to work Brilliant.